Now I will introduce our speakers today. Um, first will be Dr. Bianca C. Williams, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the CUNY Graduate Center. Her work examines race, gender, and Black women's effective lives in higher education and organizing communities. The investigative thread that binds Williams' organizing, teaching, and research is the question, how do Black women develop strategies for enduring and resisting the effects of racism and sexism while maintaining emotional wellness? Most recently, she co-edited the book Plantation Politics and Campus Rebellions, Power, Diversity, and the Emancipatory Struggle in Higher Education. Always thrilled to talk about the power of Black women's writing, Williams was the inaugural scholar in residence at Well-Read Black Girl in 2022. She was also a member of the Site Black Women Collective, a movement that she'll be speaking about today. Second is Dr. Nick Nikki Agat, who is currently the Assistant University Librarian for Research Data and Digital Scholarship at the University of Pennsylvania and a co-principal investigator on the Mellon-funded Humetrics HSS initiative where Humetrics stands for Humane Metrics. It's a project that works with research intensive institutions to help them align their indicators of success and decision-making systems with their values. Nikki is passionate about promoting open, equitable, and ethical research and scholarship, nurturing interdisciplinary communities of practice, facilitating research communication beyond the academy, and advocating for the value and recognition of scholarly work beyond the article and a monograph. And finally, today's moderator is Dr. Alicia Galvez, Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies at Lehman College and of Anthropology at the Graduate Center. Most of her work is at the intersection of migration, health, and conceptualizations of citizenship. She is currently conducting new research on epistemologies of food, health, and nutrition, as well as a project on the colonial assumptions underlying higher education pedagogies, technologies, and bureaucracies. I asked Alicia to moderate today because I met her thanks to a course she taught last spring called Citational Practices and Politics, Writing for Liberation. I was so excited when I saw her course description and I'm so excited today to help bring the conversation to a broader audience. But before I pass the mic, I am just going to share my screen for a moment and um, go through a few slides about journal impact factor. Um, so journal impact factor is one very well known but very problematic way of evaluating research and researchers. Um, probably everyone here has heard of impact factor, but how many of you really know what it means? So let's quickly demystify it so we can all better understand why today's conversation is so urgently important, both for CUNY and for academia more broadly. So how is it calculated? Ready? Brace yourself. It's the number of citations in a given year to a specific journal's articles for the two years prior, divided by the number of articles that journal published those two prior years. That sentence is almost impossible to make sense of. So let's look at a specific example. So the most current impact factors is still the 2021 impact factors. So a journal's impact factor for 2021 is the number of citations in 2021 to articles in that journal from 2019 and 2020, divided by the total number of articles in that journal from 2019 and 2020. So that's the formula. But what does it mean? In plain language, for a given journal, it's the average number of times articles published in 2019 and 2020 were cited in 2021. But what does it really mean? What does it tell us? And the answer is not much. It's a calculation of an oddly specific average, and it doesn't mean any more than that. So the fact that it's oddly specific is not necessarily a problem in and of itself, but there are many problems with how impact factors are interpreted and applied, and what follows is just a partial list. So impact factors mean nothing on their own. Different fields have different citational practices, so impact factors are only meaningful relative to other journals in the same field. Also, impact factor is based only on two years of data 
it prioritizes fast citation and thus rewards journals that publish fuzzy articles. And it's based on citation counts, but not all citations to a work are endorsements, far from it. Some very poor articles are actually very highly cited. Also, impact factor is simply not a measure of journal quality, but it's often used as a shorthand for quality. Journal quality or article quality or researcher quality when publishing in that journal. As a result, it has an undue influence on journal reputations and when relied on by tenure and promotion committees and other bodies tasked with evaluating and deciding the fate of researchers, it has undue effect on researchers' careers. And finally, researchers' citational practices are infused with bias, making citation counts themselves problematic. So you might be thinking, wait, a tally of citations, it's just an objective number, a mathematical fact. What's problematic about that? And all I can say is just you wait. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Bianca. Oh my goodness, Jill. <laughs> I have so much to say and you just like, yeah. So I'm very passionate about this topic. Hi everyone. I'm so happy to see all of you. Um, I'm very passionate of, about this topic and I thought that the best way for me to kind of introduce like why I was picked on to be on this panel or why I would be invested in this conversation is just to talk about how I got here. Um, and I'm going to time myself so I don't go over and, and give Nikki plenty of, of time to speak. So, um, why I'm so passionate about this particular topic. One reason is because I almost didn't get tenure because of this particular topic. So at the University of Colorado Boulder, which where I taught before I got here, my book was in press, was in production, was complete draft already there, great reviews, great external review letters, everything, almost didn't get tenure. Why? Because my department um, was afraid that the university would turn down my tenure case because the book wasn't sitting on the table. And what that means was that they were afraid that my other writings that were more public facing, that weren't um, always in the best peer reviewed journals for our discipline, that my book, the, the epitome, the, the, the best form of capital <laughs> that we have of scholars would be the thing that would prove to the university. Um, and to, to be honest, the white folks who didn't understand ethnic studies, which was the department I was in, that I was a rigorous scholar, the, the book was what they were waiting for. And because the book was not sitting on the table, um, they didn't want to support my tenure case. Lucky for me, I, literally my, my chair told me, you're going to be a star in the academy one day. You are a great teacher. You're a great writer. You're a great researcher. But because this book is not sitting here, we cannot support your case because they already don't take ethnic studies seriously. And therefore, they won't take us seriously if we pass you into tenure, pass you into tenure. So this is why I'm so passionate <laughs> about this topic, because I know, just like Joe was saying, like, what does this mean? I didn't even know that this was the formula. Thank you, Joe, for teaching us today. What does this mean? This means that H factor, Google Scholar stats, things that are just quantitative um, assessments of how we are maybe read in the field or not, really not only affect people's lives, I wouldn't be sitting here today if people didn't organize and fight for me to get tenure that I rightfully earned, um, but they affect who the voices that are included in higher ed, they, have, um, they affect who is able to remain here, who's not pushed out, and they affect the, the types of teaching and teachers that our students get. Um, so while H factor seems extremely random and completely like, how did we get here? <laughs> um, it actually is very meaningful because it actually pushes out a lot of folks who are no longer here. Um, and so I'm very passionate about it. And what that experience taught me was a lot about the kind of political economy of higher ed. But what I decided to do about it was I joined some other faculty who were more senior than me. And as anthropologists, we decided to write um, a series of recommendations for the American Anthropological Association, our professional organization, um, some uh, to, to write a set of recommendations so that departments could assess 
public facing work. We wanted them to be able to assess value, push departments to, to um, really value institutionally and structurally the type of work that may be blog posts, um, series of social media posts, um, legislation and policy that people created, um, art, theater, a variety of ways that people express um, their expertise, they express their knowledges, and teach, that we teach in a variety of ways that are not always peer-reviewed journals. So if I remember, um, before the end of this, I will put those recommendations in the chat so that people can use them, both as graduate students in your programs, but also as faculty at a variety of institutions, so that you can see that there are professional organizations that are attempting to push universities to value a wide variety of um, forms of knowledge and the ways that we communicate those forms of knowledge out to to the world and inside the academy. So one, tenure and promotion guidelines. The second one, the reason why I'm here is because the Publix Lab. So I'm the faculty lead at the Publix Lab. Part of the reason why I'm so passionate about the Publix Lab um, at the GC is because we are, we are responsible for two things. One, for transforming doctoral education to make it less harmful, less violent, and more um, healthy <laughs> and to center emotional wellness in the process of doctoral education. I know an impossible task, but that's what we're trying um, to prepare graduate students for careers in a variety of fields, not just in the academy, but um, to prepare graduate students to communicate their expertise and their knowledge and their research in a variety of spaces. Um, and the last thing was for us to kind of really promote public scholarship. Again, communicating um, our knowledge is in a variety of ways and being able to train graduate students to do research in a variety of places. Um, we shouldn't only be training graduate students to do work in peer review journals. Maybe 10 people read those articles, okay? So we're hoping that people will more broadly um, be able to communicate their research and expertise. Finally, um, as a former member of Site Black Women, the collective, um, I will also try to remember to put in the chat. Um, I recently wrote a piece on Black feminist citational praxis and disciplinary belonging um, from my experience with site Black women and from the last maybe five years of anthropology really trying to um, address the erasure and marginalization of Black women's intellectual and Black feminist um, intellectual labor in the discipline. Site Black women has laid out kind of a some guidelines for how to do better with citational politics. Who are you reading in your um, in your required theory courses? How are you learning about how, how to cite and who to cite? Um, why are we not questioning the people that are constantly lifted up as uh, central to our disciplines? Um, who is being seen and heard and who is being plagiarized <laughs> in our disciplines? Um, uh, Kristen Smith, the creator and founder of, of Cite Black Women, um, wrote a beautiful piece that details um, why she came up with the collective. And basically she was sitting at a conference one day, she was listening to a paper and the person presenting was literally plagiarizing her work in front of her without citing her. Um, and so that's why she created the collective. And there were so many of us that um, understood that experience, that understood what it meant to be marginalized in discipline. Um, not only like, oh, touchy feelings, we feel left out and we're invisible, but like literally folks pushed out of career opportunities um, because we are not being cited. Kristen has an amazing article called We Are Not Named um, with her graduate student, Dominique, where they go through and quantitatively, quantitatively analyze who is citing Black women anthropologists in anthropology. And it is less than 1%, 1% of us are being cited in anthropology journals. Um, and of that 1%, almost 95%, I believe, I know Alicia knows these stats better because you taught that amazing class that I wanna hear about. Almost 95% of that 1% were other black women anthropologists citing those black women anthropologists. So this is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> this is a problem about who is being seen um, as important and, and, and central and significant in our disciplines. Um, how are people being pushed out of disciplines because they do interdisciplinary work um, and they um, are using analytical tools from a variety of spaces. They're being promiscuous with their reading and their tools and so therefore not seen as sociological enough, political side enough, anthropological enough. Um, and how are we training our graduate students to do a better job job 
at do, being relevant as researchers and scholars in the world that is being created. And this political moment where we need as many people thinking creatively and reimagining the world that we're living in, how is citational politics affecting um, and shutting down the creativity that is po possible in the academy? So I'll just stop there. I'm very excited. And I wanna hear about Alicia's class if we get a moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now over to you, Nikki. All right, let me see. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, okay. This part always takes a moment. Um, okay, share that. And is that? All right. I really want to resist the urge to ask if you can all see my screen, but I'm going to ask if you can all see my screen. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you so much. So, um, and thank you. Thank you, um, Bianca, for that. Um, as someone who was accused of being a dilettante by her dissertation committee, I <laughs> really appreciate um, the work that you're, the, that you're doing there. So I'm Nikki Agate, I'm a co-PI on the Humetrics Initiative, um, and I'm excited to be here to talk to you about our work, which really tries to promote and support a values-based and process-oriented approach to decision-making and evaluation in the academy. And so we really believe that um, decision-making practices and the processes that make up our everyday work should be firmly um, anchored in clearly articulated and negotiated and mutually, mutually understood values. And so at the heart of our work is the recognition that the culture of higher education, as you all just heard, is shaped by toxic practices and processes of scholarly communication. So academia values what it can count, number of articles, citations, theses directed, rather than making it about what institutions and scholars purport to value, right? And so the professional pressures of these metrics, as we just heard, can discourage scholars um, from engaging in the work like formative review or mentoring or community engaged participatory research the kind of work that like made them get into this business in the first place right the kind of work that maybe our institutions were actually built to sustain so for us in humetrics we believe this is because the assessment of scholars and scholarship is all about the end products of research rather than about the processes of scholarly activity writ large so if all academia values is the quantity of research outputs and their quantifiable impact, then how people are assessing or publishing or circulating their work or how they perform the other functions of their profession, such as teaching and mentoring and, and committee work, don't matter a damn. So rather than focusing on research outputs or products that are metrics, we follow the Swedish chef and we try to intervene at the level of process. So we began almost eight years ago by asking on its surface what seemed to be a fairly simple question. What would it look like to start to measure, I don't know, things like openness or equity or community, all of those big words in university mission statements. What would it look like to start to measure what we value in terms of annual reviews, decision-making, tenure and promotion, rather than valuing only what we can readily measure? So the Humetrics team built our own values framework. And for a hot second, we thought, this will be the values framework to rule them all. And everyone will buy in with this. And then we had a workshop and quickly realized that, nope, values have to be local, right? Um, what works for one institution may not work for another. And the process of building out from values to indicators has to be done contextually, right? So what works as an indicator for a historian working with community archives might not translate for a visual artist who's putting on an exhibition, right? Or for a scholar at a Midwest land grant institution and a scholar in an African institution. Now, I know we're saying that we're centering this in values and I'm guessing that some of you might be a little bit cynical about values. Um, if you've been frustrated at your institution for claiming to value diversity and then hiring one person with no support or budget and patting themselves on the back, maybe, or if you've colleagues who talk about equity of access and then subscribe to another read and publish deal, 
or if your institution talks a lot about the importance of engagement with the local community, but then only values publications that that community will never ever be able to read, you know what I'm talking about. Values washing is real. So maybe your institution has thrown down a set of buzzwords in a mission statement without defining what they mean. Maybe they even put them in a word cloud. I like to think with, with um, James Baldwin here, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. Attempts to bring the norms and habits of an institution into alignment with stated values are often hollow and unsuccessful because they're rarely backed with any kind of structural power or significant resources. Uh, back in 2021, the Humetrics team um, interviewed about 125 administrators and faculty from all of the Big Ten institutions. And these are some of the comments that we got from them about values. Most institutions don't have any. Our dollars dictate our values. <laughs> it's really, really depressing. So since then, we've been working with faculty and staff at a range of institutions and departments, including, I see you, Rochelle and uh, Jean at BMCC, we're working with them. We're helping across the country, helping people build values frameworks from the ground up, facilitating conversations between colleagues as they negotiate and define their values together. And then the goal is that you have a shared framework that you can then use to guide decision making at the institution everything from sort of budget allocation to annual review. And then you have to sit down and make a plan about how you're gonna get there. What are your milestones? What are your stepping stones? How are you gonna check in with your values? Um, if you're interested in doing some of that work on your own, we do have a toolkit available online and I'll show you the link at the end. But at, at every sort of institution that we work with, this one thing has become clear, that values conversations have transformative power when you begin to sit and think about how you're going to enact them. Here's the thing though, in that same 2021 white paper, another thing became really clear. Everyone at an institution seems to believe that the responsibility for making change at once belongs to everyone and no one, right? So the deans say, oh, it's the provost. He has to decide and the provost is like, well, no, faculty governance, like the faculty decide. and the faculty are like, we, I don't know, the chairs decide. And so the devil's in the details, right? If a team or department or library or institution is serious about aligning their values with their decision-making, with their assessment, that work happens at all levels, not just at the top and not just by throwing a story worthy position at it and patting itself, ourselves on the back. So I think one of the, the, the real foci of Humetrics at the moment is encouraging people to focus on process so they can see where they have the ability to enact change. Focusing on the how of something rather than the what gives everyone involved the space to enact their values along their way. Being intentional about embodying values is a lot of work and I'm not gonna say it's not. Like you were talking about open access a moment ago. Openness isn't just right about who has access to scholarship, but also who gets read, whose work is amplified, who's who we collaborate with or the defaults we assume. So it's an opportunity to interrogate the sources we're using and the labor we're crediting and the content matter and provenance of the hidden collections that are being brought to light. And for me, so it's always, always about asking ourselves who gets to create and speak and be read and heard and who gets to consume and who doesn't, to Bianca's point on why that might be. So I think for Humetrics, we would say there is the enormous creative potential for transformative change in higher education. A bunch of really smart people getting together and wanting to move things. And it doesn't necessarily require tectonic shifts in institutional structures, but small micro adjustments in how we put the values that we say we care most deeply about into concrete action. Every intervention can move us closer to living up to the values that so many of us sought to embody when we decided that we were gonna become part of higher education with our lives. And we honestly believe that the changes brought together can have a really transformative effect. Thank you.
I think, should I go next, Joe? Okay. Um, thank you both for just incredible food for thought um, and inspiration, uh, not just today, but always <laughs> in your work. Um, this was really great um, to hear more about the Humetrics process um, and to hear Bianca talk about the personal, I didn't know the personal background of how you came to this topic. And so it's it's always powerful to hear where exactly these ideas come from. So in my role as moderator, um, I will uh, work to foster a conversation. Um, and I would like to encourage everyone, um, you know, beginning as soon as now, if you want to start posting some questions in the chat, um, I'd like to um, just uh, talk about just a, a couple of things that I see coming up already as themes. Um, and then we can get into a QA and a and, and moderated discussion. Um, and per Bianca's request, I'll also explain uh, the citational politics uh, and practices course in the MALS program and how that came about. Um, but I think one of the things that's you know coming up really powerfully already is just that there's really no separating um, the history of citational practices and the metrics of, um, of academic success in our, in academia from colonial Western European Eurocentric white supremacist histories. Um, these, these metrics, these histories have very much to do with um, ideas about authorship that center um, particularly white male voices, historically European voices. And there is no separating citation and metrics um, of success in academia from from politics. They are always already political and reflective of social hierarchies and biases. And I think it's what we've very powerfully come to understand already this afternoon is just the way that we are at CUNY, um, an institution that is in the interest of the public good, that has a transformational mission at its heart. A lot of us come here because of that mission, stay here because of that mission. Um, and we are often using metrics and strategies for hiring um, and for assessing uh, faculty achievement, guiding our students and training our students in the graduate programs um, in very traditional, in some ways, old fashioned and out of date methods that are overly quantitative, that don't take into consideration um, a lot of the um, public facing work that a lot of our a lot of our scholars do and we still hear even at cuny um the advice being given to junior faculty um hold off hold off on that <laughs> that doesn't count yet get tenure and then you can do whatever you want um when in fact a lot of the people that we are that we are admitting into our graduate programs, hiring into our programs, it is precisely because of their public facing work, because of their commitments to their communities that they're invited into this community. And then the, the messaging changes um, in terms of how um, they are uh, meant to, to, to prove, to stay, to prove their, their eligibility for, for tenure um, and for a long, or even for hiring for full-time positions. Um, I want to acknowledge um, not only uh, echoing what what Nikki said in terms of you know there there can be a certain skepticism a certain pushback I think you were referring to a different skepticism Nikki but there can also be a skepticism that we hear um, across the academy a lot of us are coming from humanities and social sciences where these conversations have been happening already for quite a while um, not long enough. Um, but we don't necessarily hear these same conversations happening in STEM fields and other fields. And I want to acknowledge uh, the work of Chanda Prescott Weinstein, um, who's a really powerful article in the Science Journal, um, Making Black Women Scientists Under White Empiricism, the Racialization of Epistemology and Physics, makes a very powerful argument that it is not only Black women phys physicists who are disadvantaged by citational politics and practices that don't cite Black women enough, but it's physics that's actually impoverished. The science that we do, whatever our field, the knowledge production is impoverished when people are pushed out of the academy or when they are not cited sufficiently um, to, to build their careers. And so um, I think we have a lot of um, 
starting point here to think about the ways that um, all of these practices are dia dialogical, contextual, and ever-changing, and building on the inspiration from the site Black Women Collective, from projects like Humetrics, I think there's a lot of um, room for us to start thinking about how we can train our students differently. I think too often we teach citation in the academy, particularly at the undergraduate level, we teach it in a, in a carceral fashion as something that students have to do correctly or be punished. Um, and that it's somehow a, you know, a last minute thing that you have to do, that you have to check that you've properly cited um, it, as though uh, it's really just about pl plagiarism prevention <laughs> rather than encouraging students um, to think about a personal citational practice. And this is a conversation um, that I've been inspired to have with my graduate students and with my undergraduate students after seeing um, the site, hashtag site Black Women t-shirts at an American Anthropology Association meeting in Washington, DC, I think in 2018, and really asking myself, what can I do um, as someone who considers myself an ally of faculty of color? How can I uh, change my syllabi, change the conversation when I'm on search committees, change the conversation and training of my master's and, and, and doctoral students, and one of the most powerful ways, I think, is to encourage um, students and, in fact, our colleagues to take an, an empowered and very personally mission-driven <laughs> approach to their own citational practice, praxis and to really develop a cit citational practice in what I like to call thinking of citational practice as a love letter to those who have inspired our thought and to think about ways that we can expand cit citational practice to be inclusive of our commitments. Um, and here I would like to cite the Mariner article. I think someone may, I think Bianca, you may have put a link up from the feminist anthropology keywords issue on citation. Um, Kay Mariner writes about how to expand citational practices well beyond uh, the traditional um, ways that we that we do and think about this. Um, so I'd like to open it up now. I have some questions, but I'm sure that all of us have a lot of questions. And so um, let's hear uh, what what thoughts are that that people are already having. Did you want one of us, Nikki or I, to go? Um, if you have something to say, please go for it, Bianca. I'm sure people will jump in with questions. And okay. I also, I'm you were one in the larger group. Got it. Um, I'll, just say, I'll just say um, two things that your comments made me think about. Um, that so if these things are the oppression. <laughs> of these things are sometimes in the nitty gritty. Like I, I was having a conversation, I was, I was having a mentoring conversation with a junior tenure track um, friend the other day. And we were talking about prepping their dossier for tenure and promotion. And I was saying, oh, I don't know if someone told you in year one on the tenure track, but you can't collaborate with too many people because once you collaborate with that person, whether they're a co-author or their name is on your CV in a formal way, you can't count them as an external reviewer. And this person was like, what? How is that possible? And I was like, yeah, so don't write with anyone that you want to review your file at tenure and promotion. But this person is one of the most collaborative, collective community-based people that I know in our discipline. So at least 20 people were already not allowed to be on her list, right? Um, that is a Black feminist praxis, to be collaborative, to be collective, to be communal. We only survive in this space if we work with other folks um, for coverage, for, you know, for the, the, to be able to build together. And we are being penalized for it in mm -hmm. our promotion cases. So something as simple as that, that actually by collaborating with too many people as a graduate student, between graduate student and mentors, you are actually putting yourself at a disadvantage during tenure and promotion. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and you see it in the citational politics of it. The other thing is um, the our commitment to public facing work, to public scholarship. The reason why so many marginalized folks, particularly racialized marginalized folks, um, end up getting pushed out of the academy is because I, I think Nikki mentioned this earlier and I know, I know Alicia did also, 
why we came here <laughs> was to do work <laughs> that was, you know, anti-racist or resistant or transformative in some way, oftentimes, not always, right? That shouldn't be a burden put on everyone. But many of us come here to do that work. And during graduate training, we are forced to have ourselves cut up. Parts of ourselves are being forced to be um, ignored or pushed aside um, in the process of finishing the PhD and, and also getting a tenure job, a tenure track job if you want that. And so it's our responsibility as faculty when we are looking at the applications of students who are trying to come into our programs to value the expertise and experience that they already have, not that we're training them to have, but people who work in museums, people who are artists, people who are the amazing like Black Twitter person that we all know runs the conversation on feminism on Black Twitter, that should be valued as knowledge and experience and something that is useful um, when we are admitting our students, not something for them to put aside for 12 years until they get tenure. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think even in admissions, um, there are ways that we can push back this, you know, citation is not only the only thing citation is deeply connected to so many things and if you want to really get to the values that your department cares about ask them about their curriculum every department that goes through curriculum change and talks about what is taught in their intro courses that's when you see people's politics show up and that's where you see um, their resistance uh, to change show up and so I think that's a good place for people to do some ethnographic analysis around uh -huh. Thank you for that. I think um, one of the things that came up when you, for me when you were talking, and I think Nikki as well, is one, our own CUNY colleague, Donna Ian Davis, said about the um, site Black Women Collective's work that a lot of people um, kind of come away uh, chastened and then, and then, you know, in that maybe 5% of people that are citing Black women, Unfortunately, even within that percentage of people who are citing Black women, that there's a fair number of people who are adding citations um, to Black women's work to their work without actually changing what they're doing with it or engaging with the ideas. Um, citing Black women almost as, you know, kind of a, a reputational badge <laughs> as opposed to deep and critical engagement. So I'd like to ask you both, you know, what is the risk that can happen from kind of mis- informed or, um, you know, insufficiently intentional or thoughtful engagement with, with Black women's work. And in general, you know, the risk that we might, um, I found myself when I was, when I was initiating my process of sort of analyzing my own citational practice, I found myself using quantitative metrics, literally counting <laughs> how many white people do I have on my syllabus? Um, and am I okay with that number? And the, the answer is, you know, was no. And my syllabi have, have radically changed as I've become more comfortable with abandoning the traditional canon in, in my teaching uh, disciplines. But also, um, it can, we can supplement, su supplant, you know, sometimes more problematic quantitative metrics <laughs> for existing quantitative problematic metrics and just end up counting in a, in a differently bad way. Um, so what are the risks of some of the, you know, kind of superficial engagement with some of these ideas that both of you have seen? I mean, I would, I would like to argue less about the risks and more about the opportunities that something mm -hmm. like a syllabus can offer, not just, not for, for counting, but for deep engagement, for showing students that if you're spending a whole week on someone's work, if you're engaging deeply with it and talking through it with them, you're giving that a type of respect. Um, we've talked a long time in the humetrics, but is there a way to kind of harvest a whole bunch of syllabi from the Open Syllabus Project and look at the, num the amount of time that is being spent on on something. So it's not just that it's mentioned, right? The the straight up citation. You could be mentioned in a list of 20 people and in a footnote. But really like how is something being engaged with and, and entertained? Mm -hmm. And and on that note, I would say, you know, if you are being really intentional and thoughtful about your syllabi and doing this work, put a DOI on those things. Like have something that that will then get picked up by all of these sort of different types of citation counting machines and um, will end up 
getting back to the person whose work you cited because they'll get a notification or they'll know that you're teaching their syllabus because how many of us ever know that someone's actually teaching our work? Like, Thank you for that. Speaking of, I'm going to share my syllabus. I'm happy for anyone to use it. I haven't put a DOI on it or a Creative Commons license, but I, I will do that and reshare. But in the meantime, I'll just share a PDF. And I'd like to say that the colloquy in cultural anthropology had not yet come out. So I've added Bianca's paper to it, but there are a lot of other good articles in that that came out after um, the, the class was finished. So make sure you don't miss those. Thank you for that, um, Nikki, uh, for Jill, the uh, DOI. Bianca, do you have anything more to say about superficial, the potential for superficial engagement? I was just going to say, for students, if you don't know this and you haven't been able to publish yet, email notes to people that you are reading, that you are using their work or that their work was assigned in your course also work for their own files oftentimes. So just send them a nice note, tell them why it was useful. Those also count <laughs> in the world of uh, quantitative metrics for tenure and promotion um, files. Um, you know, I think some of this stuff, as someone who teaches and tries to practice Black feminist, you know, theory and practice in, in my world on a regular basis, I always have to ask the question of why, right? And I think sometimes um, folks talk about these things as if they're not intentional. So there's so if we were reading <laughs> the folks who are marginalized in these fields and actually taking their ideas seriously, then a lot of the practices inside higher ed would have to change. And what's happening right now at the risk of just kind of citing folks because you want to look or sound more diverse or cutting edge or whatever, um, you're being able to do that because people keep thinking about, oh, I cite so-and-so who does work out there, like in the world. Like, oh, I study you know, the movement for Black lives out there. But if you study the movement for Black lives and it has to change what it looks like in here. And then like you have, if you're citing, and really um, intensely and deeply working with Black feminist scholarship, then you have to begin to think about how the everyday policies and practices within higher ed change. And so it doesn't surprise me um, that we're not being engaged deeply. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to talk about their own experiences with citational practice or politics? Any experiences that resonate here for you or um, questions that you have or comments about your own teaching uh, practice or learning practice, graduate training? Alicia, I'll just uh, mention there's a question a bit um, a bit up in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, if you want, I can I can read it out loud to you, or you can. Oh, great! I had missed that. Please okay. do. Okay. So, um, um, Dr. Amy Beth, who is a librarian at um, Gutman Community College, says a good number of librarians are here, myself included. There is expectation at the academy that we license and guide access to citation indices, citation management tools, and more. What do colleagues at large believe the role of the library? Um, oops, sorry, what the role of the library is and what librarians can actively be doing to change the landscape. We see today's program as an example of public knowledge and education. More, more ideas and thoughts, please, as librarians step in to share taking the reins. Mm -hmm. So I'll just say that I have been in love with librarians since 2020, the summer of 2020. Like I've seen in the past few years, just how on social media and I'm becoming more aware of like the role that librarians are playing in organizing and in activist spaces. And I think like Marion Kaba has done an amazing amount of work for me around that, just learning how she's been participating in it. But also like my best friend is um, a librarian in a middle school in Atlanta um, and thinking about kind of how archives and libraries work together in this moment to really push um, not only um, what we're reading and how we're reading, but what is documented and what is preserved and, and which narratives get preserved um, in this moment of kind of vast political transformation. So I think for me, very specific things I can think of is when I was a graduate student, like I was scared of the library. I don't know why. It just felt overwhelming and like there was so much and I didn't know where to go. And as first generation, like I just didn't know how to use, you know, the databases. And I just felt so lost. And I think 
um, I can imagine like me going to find a particular book in the library and being like, yeah, that's a great book on X, but have you read so-and-so on X too? Like maybe just suggesting people to kind of put into conversation or people that can um, revise or push back against maybe some of the folks that faculty are assigning that graduate students are, or students are unaware of. Um, so just kind of offering other folks to read. But I do think, I mean, I, I wonder, I, I haven't seen it yet. So I wonder what various librarians takes would be on site black women as a praxis and as a collective and like where are the spaces where that conversation around site black women and like library spaces could happen because I, I don't I don't know that that's a that's a gap I have in my thinking I, I wonder what could be created out of those type of relationships um, right now in this moment I mean, I've been doing a lot of work with book clubs there's so much that's happening where people who are not academics who are reading I mean black women nationally are um uh, the group that is doing the most reading uh, <laughs> in the last 10 years. Um, and so it's been interesting to see with spaces where they kind of come gather together and talk about reading. And so I wonder what the connection between site Black women and librarians could be. Do any of the librarians want to take on that question from Bianca? I'll chime in with one quick thought. Um, so, right, as a scholarly communications librarian, I consider it very important to um, make sure that any of the many times students or faculty come and ask me about metrics, that I, I provide some education about what it's saying and, and what it's not. Very often graduate students, because of what they're being told, say, yes, I know, I know, I know, but this is what I'm being told and therefore I have to prioritize the high impact factor journals or whatever. Um, so right, oh, just always infusing any conversation about these markers of, um, of success. But also, I think one way librarians can really foster the citation of Black women is to buy the works of Black women and to um, uh, be mindful of the um, diversity of topics and authorship in the book collections um, um, that we that we build and curate and 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 manage, and of course, right at CUNY, our book budgets are very very small. Um, but no matter how small, we can always think about what percentage of that budget, large or small, we are um, we are directing to you know um, historically marginalized voices. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for that, Jill. I think also um, you touched on something that's really important, which is that students oftentimes, and Bianca, your comment about you know being a little bit intimidated by the library as a graduate student, I think resonates for a lot of people's experience, but oftentimes it's very extractive and transactional. <laughs> when we go to the literature, you know, I need something, I need a citation, I need something to, um, you know, I need to populate this bibliography, I need to, um, create an exam list, and we're being often buffeted by expectations within disciplinary canons that are already partial, that are already biased, and it can be very difficult to think about this as a proactive um, and potentially joyful um, practice of building a, a bibliography or, you know, a, a one's own canon and think about it differently. And I think related to this um, is one of my students in the citational politics and practice praxis class last semester or last year, uh, who's a mall student, um, said that one of the strategies that she's been using prior to taking the course was to really utilize the master's thesis um, archives at the GC. Um, and she had a very good point, which is that a lot of folks don't make it to or through the doctoral programs. And so if we want to have diversity of thought in terms of our um, bibliographies, one good place to look for it is to look at those voices <laughs> that actually have been, you know, pushed out, suppressed, um, excluded because of all kinds of reasons um, from academic success. And master's thesis might be a really um, beautiful uh, repository of really interesting thinking. I'd also like to ask you all to maybe comment on um, OER resources um, and what role, you know, I think the idea of, you know, put a DOI on it or <laughs> put a, you know, put a um, 
a, a CC license on something, what is a way that people can be proactive in terms of turning into something that's more citable, turning into something, turning, you know, other kinds of writing and publication into things that sort of count according to some of the traditional metrics as at the same time as we're trying to change the metrics. Maybe Nikki, you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I do tend to think that um, sharing even of early work is something that is often really scary for, for people in, in the more traditional humanities, um, but that if you are able to share um, online with a DOI or with a handle or with something that's going to sort of um, assert that piece as a citable object, then you're also able to assert your own idea and so I have I had a lot of conversations with people who've had their conference papers or conference ideas actually stolen. Um, and they started, some of them have started talking about, no, you know, I, I do the presentation and then I just make that version of it available online because it's a way of time stamping my work and saying, these ideas were mine. This is a work in progress because the risk of not doing it was greater than the risk of someone being like, oh, that's unfinished. Like, do you think there's a, there's sort of, it's part of that opening up that actually can, can, can get a witness around what's happening. It's really powerful. That's kind of an inversion of the idea that you sort of have to keep something close to your chest in order to keep it safe. The idea of making it public um, to keep it safe and to get that time stamping and to put out there that this, these words belong to someone. Uh, Kristen Smith and her piece in the Colloquy and Cultural Anthropology has a line where she says, I know my words like I know my children because I birthed them. And talking about that experience of being plagiarized, having her work plagiarized before her very eyes. And I think, you know, getting to normalizing that practice of putting things out there um, at an earlier stage of, of the publishing process um, is really powerful to think about. Thank you. And I think it can even start, I mean, before, you know, the faculty level or, or stage like I know people are thinking about what do collective dissertations look like what does it look like for folks to do group work for dissertations and it not maybe it's a 250 page document maybe it's something else right like what does it look like for folks to really build and work together and organize and think together at the graduate level and have it valued as really good research right mm. Thank you, Jill, for sharing that. Do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, gender differences in terms of research that you just posted about? Um, sure, I can say um, right very quickly. There have been numerous studies. So, um, so there have been studies about the gender citation gap in research um, um, for for a, a while. So there's a number of studies along those lines, whereas the uh, more intersectional studies looking at the intersection of, of gender and race, that's newer and there are fewer studies and very, very important studies. Um, um, but there just hasn't been as much time for people to engage in those sort of um, um, numeric um, environmental scans yet, but some of the some of the studies that are just looking at the the one dimensional um, differences, the gender differences, they they found things like men cite men more than women. Um, um, author groups that are mixed gender cite men more than women, even in fields where there are more women than men. And then the link I posted here, but there's particularly one chart in this article that I encourage everyone to look at. The first DOI I pasted in, um, there's an error in it. So if you look there, I posted it in again, and that should work. Um, but there's a chart looking at the words that men disproportionately tend to use regarding their own research versus the words women disproportionately use regarding their own research. And um, and the, the terms favored by, by men include things like excellent and promising. And um, I'm not looking at it now, so I'm, I can't remember the others, but there are these strong statements of their own research value. Um, um, and the women favor terms like supportive, which is also extremely important, um, but 
typically less valued in the academy. And so is it any surprise that readers who, um, that our readers are affected by the differences in those terms that are used? Um, you know, everybody's capable of, of reading with a critical eye. And yet, if, if an article is talking about like promising new results and done in a robust research study, um, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you might be more tempted to cite that article. And so there's the, um, the citational differences that are then sometimes built on our own linguistic differences mm -hmm. between the genders. Um, while I'm unmiked, I hope, um, I hope nobody will mind if I take this opportunity to ask a question to put our provost, Steve Everett, on the spot for a minute. So I'm, I've, I'm just in love with what the three of you have had to say today. I think it's so important. And I do think the time is right at the Graduate Center with the strategic planning process going on, et cetera, to really begin to institutionalize some of these, um, um, some of these better, more equitable choices we could be making in how we evaluate research and researchers. But my question for Steve is, can we also work with communications to have them in their promotional, um, um, you know, news um, press releases, news um, news articles, things like that about the Graduate Center, commit to featuring this kind of research as opposed to just the research, and not that it's just the research right now, but um, but there is a lot of celebration of articles published in Nature and Cell and journals like that, and that is wonderful, but there's a lot of other markers of wonderful research as well. Great question, Jill. Um, you know, for, for me, when, when you try to understand how a university moves to a more equitable, diverse environment that embraces not just decolonizing curriculum, not just diversifying the racial ethnic makeup of people, but to really change the foundation for the value system. And this, I think that's why it goes back to how you entitled this whole topic, which is really about the values that the university aspires to. That's the foundation that everything else is built on. And so for me, what I'm acutely aware of is that as we try to bring people in and give them support and evaluate them correctly through that value system, if the value system is already sort of a biased system that we've inherited and we're not changing that, then we're never going to achieve what we're trying to get to. So in order to bring someone whose scholarship is not embraced by their colleagues at the level of other kinds of topics of scholarship that have historically been valued, then we're never gonna make that person feel an equal member of the community. So to me, what I spend a lot of time on is thinking about the value system that departments have and to find out whether they can actually adjust their thinking foundationally to the areas that they acknowledge as being equal domains of intellectual scholarship. And that's, that's a really difficult thing for people to, to do, to embrace fields outside their sphere of knowledge and also with a hierarchical evaluative system that has been created around those traditional fields it's really hard for them to understand how do we evaluate excellent scholarship without those historical methods to put into that. To that, So to me, this is what every university that I've been associated with is struggling with this question. How do you move to a place where there is true equity? I mean, diversity is one thing, but it's the equity and the inclusion that we're talking about here that are much harder to achieve because that really means a shift in everybody's intellectual perspectives. So I love your question, Jill. Can we start to talk about the Grad Center in the way we brand ourselves, the way we communicate ourselves? Just who we are is something that needs to be always acutely changed as we're going forward for the next decade or generation until we can achieve that. And I think, I think we are well along that path because I see a lot of people who value this kind of change in every department happening now, but it, it doesn't happen overnight. And I think every university struggles with that because obviously we have people that are coming in their tenure and then they're there for the next 30, 40, sometimes 50 years. And sometimes their values are difficult to move to a new kind of perspective on that. And that's just, that's the inherent nature of the way that universities are structured historically over the last several hundred years. So as a provost, I'm really acutely aware that 
everything I'm doing is trying to sort of shake the tree a little bit to make sure that we can move to a new, more innovative way of embracing new leaves on the tree and new thought. And so the tree has an equal branch of everybody is feeling like they are an equally uh, valuable member of the community and that we evaluate them through a process which is equally valuable and 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 appropriate for them as, as individuals. So I, I don't know that I can totally say that the, the grad center is there yet, but I, but I love your question and I love the, the, the solutions you put on it. Thank you. And so we're a little bit over time. And so I thank everybody who has stayed with this far with us. And, um, um, but before we, before we end, I just want to ask if Bianca, Nikki, Alicia, do any of you have additional um, additional comments, things you weren't able to squeeze into earlier portions of the event? I just put a link to an event that the Publix Lab is sponsoring. I think it's on Thursday. It right. is on Thursday, yes. Thank yeah, you. so this was a perfect like intro conversation that leads directly into that. So if you are at the GC or in CUNY system and you want to kind of do some work like around this topic, we're actually going to do the work on, on Thursday. I just want to thank you for bringing me into conversation with these women and um, for just and to everyone here for for showing up for this. It's um, always heartening to see people who actually want to enact change. I'd like to say the same. Thank you. Thank you all for um, thank you, Nikki and Bianca and Jill for your incredible contributions and everyone for being here. And I think this is um, a conversation that has been happening and that hopefully will happen in a more even more audible and visible way so that we can uh, really push these conversations across the university. Thank you. Thank you all so, so much. <laughs>